1971 we started. I think I'll let up Steve start the conversation or kind of the dialogue about Diamond, uh, Pacific Comics, sorry. <laughs> or about Diamond Comics. It slips through a little bit. Uh, but he'll kind of give you this, this set of how Pacific Comics was started and how we uh, got involved in the business, and I'll kind of do some color commentary along the way. Thank you. We were young. That is true. How old were we? I started in business when I was 17 until I was 13. I started collecting a little earlier than that. We both had uh, dyslexia, which is a learning disorder. And it's easier to understand things visually than text. So we gravitated towards pictures. And pictures that tell stories, and that's comic books, sequential pictures. And so uh, you can understand graphics and then you said the words with the graphics and the story. And so that's really what drove me into comics. And I would go into, um, when I was in eighth grade or seventh grade, I would, we lived in the St. Beatrice Kids. And I went to St. Bridget's Elementary School. I took my bike every day to school. And on the way home, I'd stop by this little new bookstore on Carmet Street. They'd have a box of comics and I'd always buy comics there. Cents or 15 cents comic books. The lady was very nice. She'd go and hold the comics for me. Everybody else there buying Playboys, I'd be buying comic books. <laughs> maybe, maybe mixed parties, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, bring home the comic books and had little stacks in our bedrooms, built bedrooms right next to my bedroom. And I preferred DC Comics. I like Jimmy Olsen. And I like Superman. And I like Lois Lane. And I like the stories of Bizarro stuff. A lot of fun. And we would uh, occasionally find little collections here or there. And our big first collection we bought at, uh, I'm not sure which swap meet was. That had me in the beach, I think. I don't remember what swap meet was. We bought a big collection, it was, I think, $900. And it had good runs. It was good money then. We were kids, and, and we bought this collection. And we decided to try to sell some comic books. Uh, I had a little background in business. I was, we were both business people for very young. I started off when I was about eight years old. I was buying and selling items. Our family consisted of parents and five children. We had the five S Club, which the five Seamuses. And I was primarily the salesman of the people. So we'd all make pot holders or bug beads in the 60s or candy rocks. So I'd go door to door, so I was by myself, eight years old, seven years old. Our, our eldest brothers and sisters would concoct these ideas, and then put the young ones out there for the sympathy vote <laughs> of, the, of the households. Because you walk out, and you know, if you've got a 15 year old walking through the door, or an eight year old, people would buy more than an eight year old. So my eldest brothers and sisters said, look, you guys go out door to door, because you're going to sell like, the crap of everything, and we'll just collect the money. So we were like, um, we were very successful at that. <laughs> we, we sold, you know, we lived in Washington, D.C. for a couple of years. We sold um, pot pie holders and, and like little uh, hot, hot plate holders um, with hippie covers on the old uh, looms. Mm -hmm. Thousands and thousands, when, they had, when there was hippie protests, they would send us out into the hippie protests with bags of these. We'd sell all of these at the March on Washington, we'd be there selling love beats. Right. It didn't matter what they was. Whatever was hot that day, our elder brother said, for him, we got to go fo focus on that. And the five S club would go out and bang yeah, those drums. And we would uh, make hand-painted uh, black light posters and sell those. Uh, so, so they didn't know you were a capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> we were exactly. anti-war. Right. We also sold beats. Right. <laughs> exactly. So, Fast forward a little bit, we're living in Pacific Beach, we bought this collection and we decided we're going to be selling comics, uh, extras that we have. Really didn't know too much of it. Grading wasn't an issue back then, it was more getting every issue and reading them, not boarding and bagging them. We learned about that later on. So we The Over Street Press Guide actually just started being published a couple years earlier, so there was, there was a new idea of comic books had various grades. And actually back then there really wasn't any artists in the books. You just bought Superman because it was a Superman book, you didn't realize there was the Artists doing the book, and you know, there's the back in the day there was the good bar, there was a good Disney artist. No one knew his name. He was the good artist. He was the good one. Where's the bad ones? <laughs> and so we figured out that these guys actually had value, and we kind of figured out how hey, to focus on artists pretty early on. We took our first ad in the uh, the 
Myers Guide, comic books, Apple number, Lights. Number, number 13. Number 13, a full, full page ad. We advertise in that for many hundreds of issues. Right. What year was that? It was in 71, 72. 71 or 72, yeah. I might be up by half a year there, but pretty close. And it was a, the Myers Guide was a tabloid newspaper, and it was, uh, you just typed up an ad and sent it in, he'd run it. There was no, there was no design element. I literally got your, just before there was a, the bold type of, you know, you're typing away an ad, and you just continually type, so you, the more words you could put in the ad, the better the ad was as far as we were concerned. So it would be one block of words. Right. There's no spaces, just one <laughs> solid, you know, line after line. No typesetting, no, right. and it's just graphics, you just stick something down with a piece of tape and send it in to Alan and you could run it right like that. And because I was very dyslexic, it didn't really matter what it said as far as English goes. Typos or not, you know, I had no correction paper, so I just kept typing. I just, you know, wow. kept being those keys until there was no more paper left than the ad. Then the ad was done. Right. You know. And then uh, we also decided to uh, see if we could advertise in Marvel Comics and DC Comics, and we found out you could buy little display ads, and so we had our, you know, send us a quarter, and we'll send you a catalog, and you get a quarter off your first quarter. So uh, we created our first catalog. It was eight pages, and it was, uh, we had a lot of people send in the quarters. So we, uh, we sent out this catalog, and when we ran that, when we ran those first couple of Marvel ads, there weren't a lot of people back then in Marvel. There were really two advertisers: was a guy named Howard Rykowski, which his nickname was Howard Rykowski, because oh. he was had he was an East Coast guy. He was myth, he was mythological, but his let's just say his business ethics were you know less than stellar. Another gentleman in Florida named Robert Bell, who created the comic book bags, which put comic books in. What he did with comic bags, he printed on the bags on both sides. So when you back your comics, it's a rubber bell in the front of the back. Uh -huh. So you couldn't actually see the cover, but you saw a rubber bell a lot. <laughs> and like, I love the idea of the bags, but I didn't like the idea of my Superman had a rubber bell in front of them. I wanted them to have Superman coming through. So we kind of got the mark and missed the mark. So we had all